everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Today on the show, we have Zoe Helene. Zoe is Cosmic Sister. She's the head of that organization. And for a long time, they've been um, in partnership with MAPS, doing some really interesting stuff, getting female voices and now more diverse voices amplified in the psychedelic space. And it's a really great organization. Uh, this is a really fun <laughs> but really long conversation with Zoe. So if you can handle two hours, great. If that's a little too much, please just plan to take a break and come back to it tomorrow. So this is a really fun and really interesting conversation. Um, we go over stuff that I don't really believe we've touched on psychedelics today before. And uh, I think you're going to dig it. Yeah. So thank you, Zoe, for being on the show. And I really hope we can do it again. Uh, hope sometime in the future we can do it in person. It'd be really nice. So I think that's it for the intro. So enjoy it. Uh, if you want to support us, please leave a small monthly donation at patreon.com slash psychedelics today as low as $2 a month. And every donation counts. I promise it really helps us out and helps us spread our mission. So thank you for everybody that is donating. It's really awesome. And, and we do do some special stuff in there once in a while. So maybe at least just check it out to see uh, if it's something you're into. And We've got a lot of free classes available at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. There's two free classes, some less expensive classes, including the DMTX Psychonaut training for $49. We've got a course on psychedelics in the shadow, which is really interesting, and a course with uh, Kyle and Johanna Hila on Carl Jung and psychedelics called Imagination as Revelation. Very interesting one. And you can always buy Navigating psychedelics for clinicians and therapists. If you want to take your education more seriously, that's available anytime. So please jump in there. All available at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And we've got books too. We've got the trip journal and integration workbook available at psychedelicstodayshop.com or just our regular site. You'll find it there too. Yeah, I think that's it. Hope you enjoy this episode with Zoe Lane and uh, of Cosmic Sister. And um, yeah, let us know how it goes and let us know what you think. Uh, email us at psychedelicstodayemail at gmail.com or hit us up on any one of our socials. All right, that's enough for the intro. We'll see you on the other side. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have Zoe Helene, steward of Cosmic Sister. How, what is your title at Cosmic Sister? Oh, you know... Um... I guess the real word is CEO, but I don't right. care for that. So I kind of go with <laughs> chief visionary officer, but that's because I have to have a title. I, I mm -hmm. found founder works for me. You know, I'm just very chill with that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. <laughs> yeah. And I, you've been on the show before. I think we talked a little bit about how Cosmic Sister got started, but can you give us just a little bit of uh, background on how you decided to start the organization? You know, it's been a good long while. I mean, it first started as a sort of underground collective in the natural product scene. Mm -hmm. And where there are, I mean, there's many, many herbalists and where there are herbs, there are sacred plants. But that is essentially an industry that was created in order to give us better al alternatives to, well, lifestyle products that are at least allegedly more eco-friendly. That's the idea. Right. Because if you, if you want to be earth-friendly in your lifestyle and you understand what you should and should not do, but you don't have any day-to-day -day products to buy, then then you have to start from ground zero and do the off-the-grid thing. And nobody's going to do that. I mean, a few people do that. I know friends, I have friends around here who do that. But yep. for for the majority of people, if you really want to make a big difference, you have to say, okay, so you should eat organic and you should buy recycled or completely biodegradable packaging or the, or less packaging is, is also a good one or buy local or whatever else. But if there's nothing out there to buy, then people just don't have time to make everything themselves. So it's just, it's, it's not just about making money with green types of brands. It's also about providing people with a better choice because otherwise everything's mainstream, cons you know, all of the, all of the worst stuff out there, you know, you know, the stores, Oh yeah. you know, this, and this has been going on for years. I mean, Chris was part of the natural products industry way at the beginning. And that's before my time with him. And we've been together 13 years. We've met I guess we met 15 years ago. So then that's where we met. Okay. So when I first joined that 
industry, and they do call it an industry, I thought of it as a movement because I was coming in from high tech, which was very, very male dominated. And I just, I kind of, we had a lot of very interesting clients. I liked a lot of our clients personally, and some of them were very bright and we were able to do a lot of really good work with the corporate money. That was important to me. And it was all the things I love, you know, diversity, any humanitarian causes, environmental stuff. Uh, We did some really cool things with multicultural arts and with kids. So I I loved that part of the the work and I love that it was a pioneer industry. But by the end of it, I was really ready to get out. It was just not me. The corporate world felt like something I did to learn about the belly of the beast. I mean, this is a, <laughs> it really did. And it felt like that then, but it, it was such a wild ride. It was the beginning of the internet and just, you know, all of that happened long before the dot com boom, not terribly long, a few years before, but that in those years, that's like 10 or 20 years. It's, it's actually funny because I've been thinking a lot about how fast that all went. You know, that particular year, it was a decade for me of high tech and the internet revolution. There was really only 10 years, but how much I saw in those two, those 10 years and how fast it went and working with, within a pioneer field, which is what we're doing now with, with psychedelics and also watching the beginning for me, it was the really cool, creative kind of I don't want to say outcast, but maybe misfits, you know, hacker types and, and wonderful nerds from MIT and all the artists and communications people coming in and people just very uh, wonderful, creative people wanting to change the world. Got it? Because it was all about 24-7 uh, connectivity around the right. world and access. And we were all like, we were into the, the, you know, all the good stuff with technology. And, and it got very quickly gobbled up by the big capitalist companies and and just entities and individuals. So by the end of that 10 years, I was really working in the belly of the beast. And like I said, the individuals were mostly wonderful. So this is not a diss on them, uh, our clients from way back then, but, but there were also other pieces that I saw. I watched, for example, intimately on the back end I was privy to many, many, many millions of emails from people writing uh, everything from the United States Senate to large brands like Nike, American Express, people like that. And that's what we did. We basically helped them connect with their customers one-to-one or constituents or, Mm -hmm. or subscribers or whoever. But what we did with that data is learn how to slice and dice it so that it could be analyzed in various ways. And again, we were like, we were into the good stuff. We thought, oh, wow, wouldn't it be great if the United States Senate was able to really you know, send out an email and get all the replies like that night and within 24 hours, they could have all, all the answers they needed on, on you know, what are the, what's the popular opinion on this issue, things like that, which they could do theoretically if they wanted to. I mean, they're sort of doing it on social media, but not really. Um, right. social, yeah. Social media did not exist yet. I mean, they, we did some really early social media, but it did not have the infrastructure that it has today. So it was, but it was all about that. It was all about this is going to completely revolutionize the, revolutionize the world. It's never going to be the same again. And and the esoteric pieces of that was like, you know, the human species is creating this incredible way of communicating, which frankly is mycelial. I just didn't have the word for it at the time. Mm. I understood it. I mean, because the internet is mycelial. It's not. Were you Kendrick. psychedelic aware at that point? No, not at all. I mean, I was definitely working with cannabis, but I did not call it anything like that. And I didn't even think about it as a plant. Mm. I had a lot of guilt around it. I thought thought it was bad that I was, you know, but I was working with it for real. I mean, it was definitely not something I was doing to kind of fade away. It was, it was helping me understand myself. And I've been working with it since I was 21. And so I was, when I joined high tech. So this decade, I I mean, listeners are probably like, why is she talking about that? But it, (laughs) 
is relevant in so many ways today because that particular experience I had, which is multifaceted, because we also invented high the first- tech is psychedelic. It's hard for outsiders to really understand it. It is, and high tech people are also working with psychedelics today. And, and oh, so yeah. I was in Cambridge, so we were like MIT, but they were the, <laughs> always sort of the sister city with San Francisco during that time. Mm-hmm. All that. It was a cool. lot of great drugs come out of MIT. <laughs> yeah, and it was fun. You know, when we were in Harvard Square, so we had the Harvard types too. But as it kind of really grew, people started wearing suits a lot. I wore <laughs> suits. I wore suits. I mean, mm-hmm. that was weird. Okay. And by the end of it, our clients were so large that I was, I was wearing very, very expensive suits and all of the accessories had to be expensive. And, you know, it just was this game of, of upmanship. If you wanted to play at that level, you had to dress at that level. It, and it was not my scene at all. And by the end of that, I just really wanted to, I felt the call to nature. It was, mm. I had three Siberian Huskies at the time. And I couldn't wait to get home from work. And we worked hard. And it was exciting, not going to lie. But I couldn't wait to get that suit off, get in like sweats and sneakers and grab those huskies and go outside in the woods and just walk for hours. It was, it was clear that I was moving away. So when natural products came along for me, it was to leave that and think to myself, Maybe, just maybe, this will be better. Maybe the, it, it will at least have a, per, a larger percent of people who are interested in social change and environmental protection and those kinds of things that I care about. And I liked, but I wasn't naive anymore. <laughs> I had just turned 40. That was a big number. I'm 56 now, just to give listeners an idea. But I remember thinking, it's going to be the same. Every field that I go into has this unknown evils, and I'm going to just go in there with an open mind and see if I like it and see if I can switch careers here, so switch sort of my focus. And I went in as a consultant with all of the knowledge I had from what I'd been doing, which was really valuable knowledge. And mostly the natural products industry was not at all ready for what I had to offer. They thought it was five years out when they actually, they were five years behind, Um, (laughs) but uh, they're all doing it now. In fact, the irony, the biggest irony of all is that Bezos bought Whole Foods. That's so weird. See, this is what I mean. This, this also comes together in an interesting way because a lot of what I'm thinking about right now, this time in my life is I'm moving into the elder category and Mm -hmm. that is a weird, weird experience. Um, I'm I'm right smack in the middle of menopause. I know a lot of people will be weird about that and think that's an uncomfortable word, but it isn't. It's just nature, and most women go through that, and yep. that's where I am today. And it is a path, uh, sort of a rite of passage into this quote elder unquote kind of phase of life, and it, it, it's <laughs> it's just strange. Okay, mm-hmm. so when I went into natural products, I already had. I don't want to say cynicism because that's not the right word, but I had some life experience and I'd already had, I had good life experience when I went from the performing arts into high tech too. I was 30, but I've been working since I was two, you know, working really great work. I had great work. So it wasn't that I was that naive. It was that I when I started with high tech, I really had, I I saw all the goodness of the tool. I saw the potential of the tool to, to help, not just help people change the world, but save the world really. And it wasn't about me and my colleagues. It was about pulling these amazing technological inventions together in a way that regular people could make use of them. And that right. was that was new. It was new. Okay, people did not have that. Before. It was. It just. It's very hard to explain that to someone who grew up in a world where they always had high speed internet. It's so hard. It's it, and it makes me feel so old. Like somebody, like my grandfather, saying he remembers having a, a you know, a truck that he had to buy a truck after having a, a horse drawn buggy, right. and working himself up to the truck. You know, I, I feel like that and yet I'm not that old. And this wasn't that long ago. This is like 1994. 
to 2004. Those were my years. So the speed at which things change is extraordinary in that field, and it still is. However, now what we have with this is this is where I'm going with this is I watched corporate America and really what I call cannibalistic capitalism. Mm -hmm. I I witnessed that take over that scene, the high tech scene. And most, not all, but many, many of the people I knew who were the most creative and most interesting were kind of pushed out. And the same, the other thing I witnessed was you would build a fantastic brand with really innovative products and everything like your clients or your customers loved it. And then people would sell it and then they would dump all the team that created it. And then they would destroy the brand. That happened over and over and over again. And it made no sense to me at all. But there was so much money flying about in that period of time that people would think nothing of spending 200, 500 million dollars. It was nothing. You say in not- silicon, in tech and in natural foods, you mean? It, in high tech, not, not yeah. the uh, natural foods yet. So yeah, they were throwing around. It was like, Dick size, okay? It was like you'd sit at a table and they were almost always men. I was mostly the only woman around. And they would sort of go, Well, I sold the company for two hundred million dollars. And the other one would go, Oh, that's good. That's a good start. And you know, I I just closed and just sold another uh company for four hundred million dollars. And it would be, you know, going around the table, I just thought, are they making this up? It was it was as if I was in some kind of surreal movie. Mm. The types of money those, and they just they just threw it out at tech companies that didn't have real technology. There was vaporware being sold. There was everybody and his brother thought they had a great idea for the dot com business business when they had no business plan or anything innovative at all. It was insane, and and anybody else who went through that knows what I'm talking about. Okay? Yeah. So I was interning in software starting at about ninety nine, I think. Uh, I love it. I love that. You know <laughs> In Burlington, what Mass, about. not far from where you were. Okay. You know what happened. And you watched the oh, gentrification yeah. and how impossible it was to find anywhere to live at a port. Oh, uh, not to mention the collapse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, but I always tell people, you know, dot com still exists. I mean, you know, Google is a dot com. Amazon is a dot com. So, there really were good dot coms. They just, the idea of dot com and buying a dot com and the dot com bust and all that was people outside of the industry talking about it like it was, it was something they didn't understand what they were talking about. So there are still plenty of dot coms are making their fortune. I mean, Twitter's a dot com, you know, Facebook's a dot com, Instagram's a dot com. They are, they all have dot com after them. Just saying, okay. So I couldn't stand it anymore. And I, I wanted the, I love the idea of being really part of the things that I had loved doing most in high tech, which was giving money to, you know, environmental organizations. And like I said, multicultural arts, a lot of times, um, and just really supporting those kinds of things and under, um, privileged kids, a lot of under, a lot of that, which that, that really meant a lot to me. People who just didn't have what, you know, they were lovely, bright young kids who didn't have books, for example. So we got them books. It was, uh, that was great. a beautiful, beautiful part of my position that I, I, I really loved it and wished I could have done that full time. Kind of reminds me of the North Star Pledge a little bit. Like, how do we give back when we're yeah. doing so well, if we are planning to do that well? Well, the fun part about that was I got to also speak with my favorite clients. You know, like somebody like American Express, you know, those people were class acts. They really were. And if if I would bring them an idea and say, hey, would you like to match this? This uh, I think we called them. They weren't grants. They were something else. I forget what we had a name for what we did. But I'd say, look, we're going to give twenty five thousand dollars. Can you or we'd say 50 and they'd say yes. You know, so they'd match it. And that made it all possible. Because we really we weren't that big, and oh, and by the way, without going into all the gory details, I did not end up with any money. My ex took it all. We'll mm. leave it at that. So, guys, I, I don't want people to think that I'm very wealthy, and that's why I give these grants. <laughs> not at all the case, and I can co- I can completely understand why they might think that is. We were successful. I did make a lot of money, but I never got it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't just on paper. It was legitimate money. And it's a long story that I can't tell. 
uh, yet. <laughs> someday, <laughs> Understood. Yep. Uh, someday. Uh, but yeah, so here, I, so then I said, I'm, I'm defecting into another field. I'm going to go into natural products and, and check out the scene. So I did. And here's the gist of it. Loved it. Loved a lot of the people. Still know some of the people from that scene. Um, Paul Stamets I met there. Um, <laughs> lots of people. Mark Blumenthal, American Botanical Council. I don't, I mean, I can't even tell you all the herbalists because, you know, early on I did tend to go towards the people who were super smart and interested in nature and turned on by science as well. And the entrepreneurial aspect of it was interesting to me too, and that's also how I made my living. Um, but I I quickly learned that there was quite a bit of sexism there as well, and it was it was a bummer, but it wasn't a surprise because, like I said, by then I knew that you know you can't take a section of humanity out of an entire culture that's basically built on male supremacy. You can't take a chunk of a culture and just expect it not to kind of be similar. You mm -hmm. might have a little bit better people in it, which was definitely true of natural products. I mean, the, the sexism there is nothing compared to the sexism in high tech. And that, <laughs> the sexism in high tech is nothing compared to the sexism in performing arts <laughs> as an right. industry. Okay, like I don't know anything that compares to that. But <laughs> so, so in natural products at that time, I always thought this was such an interesting and telling statistic. In the Fortune 500, which were mainly our clients, in fact, our clients were mostly Fortune 100, there were only 5% female CEOs at the time. And when I moved into natural products, there were 25% female CEOs. Mm. That's a huge difference, but it's still not half. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge difference, but it's, it's still not like enough. Absolutely. Yeah. And you saw this little microcosm of people who had many of whom had been in there for a while and done really well and made a lot of money. Um, but they also were, it was still male dominated. And even though many of those men were really great guys, it still doesn't work. Because the moment you have a domination of something, in this case gender, you, you have people struggling to get to the top and people holding those doors, you know, and, and they're you know, guarding those doors and letting people in who they think are worthy. And when there's a male, female kind of a thing going on, you mean the bottom line is you're going to get young, beautiful women flirting with much older men to get in. And you're going to have much older men accepting that attention. And it just is the same bullshit. And it was, there was plenty of it. And I decided to start Cosmic Sister then and just undercover with people, you know, all the women and start kind of talking about what was really going on. And they all told me their horror stories, but they didn't want to go public. So I realized, ah, got it. There's a fundamental flaw in this. And that flaw is that it's a trade show, basically, where we don't usually meet. It's a trade. This is about making money, making a living. These people can't tell their stories out loud because they'll lose their jobs, they'll lose their clients, they'll lose their whatever. And I realized that that was a, a fundamental flaw. Um, and it really taught me a lot. And I mm. moved on again. I moved on mm -hmm. again. So um, when I eloped with Chris, I ended up kind of having to figure out where the heck I landed and did a lot of running around the world with him at first with medicinal plants. And that was all very exciting. And that also led me to ayahuasca. But I want to skip all that today and just say, when, when I went through those different um, fields, they were pioneer industries, if you will. Natural mm -hmm. products was still pioneering at the time, although it was really starting to get taken over. But it was still all about, it was purpose-driven business, right? It was, it was like, we, oh, we forgot to be born kajillionaires, so we have to make a living. So why don't we, you know, start a really cool company that really helps indigenous people in the rainforest? And we make money and they make money and everybody's happy. And um, we, we also, at the same time, you know, help kids down the river. I'm talking about Sambazan, Acai. I'll just give them that little, mm -hmm. little 
you know, plug there, but there's so many ex- examples of that, you know, where you, yeah, you do really well. You, you have your own money, but you also give a lot more than most corporate entities would give. Patagonia is a great example. They're not exactly in natural products, but they're definitely an eco-friendly brand. And he just decided one day, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go bigger. I'm going to stay at a certain level, which is big enough for me. I'm making plenty of money and I'm going to give money away. And I'll tell you something. I keep finding Patagonia as a sponsor in some of the things that I care the most about, Mm -hmm. like all by, you know, preservation and uh, protection, because that's the deepest part for me. That's, a, that's where that's where I, I, I feel like their model, Zoe, is one of the ones mm-hmm. that people should be looking for. Like this is yeah. how yeah. a company can, you know, keep its soul in a lot of ways. Or you know, the title of the guy's book is uh, what was it? Yvonne Chenard, uh, "Let My People Surf." So like when right. surfs up, they yeah. can go surfing. <laughs> I remember calling him uh, during, I was doing something for Organic Spa Magazine. It was a roundup and I wanted to feature one of their new pieces because I knew that they had a great story. And I, I called in and this really sweet young guy picked up the phone and said, oh, you know, nobody's in right now. And, um, and I said, nobody? And he says, no, surf's up. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. That's great. You guys are the coolest ever. Don't worry about a thing. I'll call tomorrow or whenever. Uh, but I, I, I always remember that. And I thought they never lost what it's about. Yeah. I think they do childcare on site, like paid for. There's so many I great thought, perks for that. the employees. I wouldn't, surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. And you know, one of the high tech companies that was part of our, you know, was one of our partners was Lotus, which most people mm-hmm. never heard of. But they had an amazing company, and they they had childcare on site, and it was really nice. And it was so sweet when I, we went to visit them. Uh, we would see all the little kids wait for the end of the day, and then when they, their parents would come out of the building, and all the kids would parade at the. It was just it was so humane, you know. It was humane, and yep, so in I'm, ways that you don't expect it for sure. Yeah, these models have been proven. And proven and proven and still look at where we are. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'll just say, because I do think this is about psychedelics. I do. Because right now, the corporate people are on to psychedelics in such a big way. It is mm-hmm. happening so fast. Did you see Compass uh, Pathways is doing an IPO soon? Or they filed some papers to do an IPO? Uh, Which is really weird because they filed as a nonprofit in England. Uh, interesting. They yeah. probably have a for-profit wing. Right. Or, or they're going to just totally transition again, which is going to be interesting. Or no, you know what it was? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm misleading. It, I think it was an American nonprofit that moved internationally and became a for-profit. And then that's when all the money was coming in. And now uh, they'll be doing an IPO. Well, um, you know, it's, it's drugs. Yeah. It's, it's pharma for sure. It's pharma. It is pharma. Yeah. See, my life and my interest in psychedelics is completely different. Like I'm a purist. I come from an ethnobotanical perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the synthetics because I understand that, first of all, a lot of people would never trust a plant or a fungi. They wouldn't. They want a pill. (laughs) pill. I trust them all, but I I understand. (laughs) But a lot of people, that's what they want. And Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about people in our scene either. I'm talking about the masses. Like if some dog gives you a prescription, they want to get it at CVS. Mm-hmm. They don't want to go to a Maloka in the Amazon. <laughs> that's right. not where their head's at. So, okay, that's cool. They deserve healing too. But my interest is I, the poetics and the idea of being co-evolutionary allies. That is just, to me, very, very meaningful. And that's how these sacred plants uh, express through me, you know, when I'm in a visionary space, that's how I experience them, you know, and I love that. I just love that, that evolutionary connection. And it's really co-evolutionary because we did evolve with these sacred plants. As Absolutely. And co-evolution is a fascinating sort of category within that's Michael Paul. My favorite Michael Pollan book was Botany of Desire, like more so than How to Change Your Mind. I thought that whole concept of co-evolution is unbelievable. It is, and it's the entire field of studying yeah. biology, and you, you can get many examples of that, including wildlife. You know, like mm-hmm. I'm always telling people, you know, we can't 
we can't, there's a tree here that's having trouble. Um, apparently and I just had a tree guy come to the place and mm. we talked about how can we help some of these trees from after the storm without hurting the wildlife that's still living in them. And, you know, can we wait when's the best time to get, you know, to, to trim or to take down a tree and all this stuff. And he talked about a, a blight that's coming through just like it did with the uh, chestnut tree mm-hmm. here. And some, there, there's going to be some animal out there that depends on these trees to survive. And we don't necessarily know what all those really living beings, we don't really know all of them. But there are certain species that depend on only one, like the monarch butterfly, for example. And mm-hmm. that's the only one, the luna moth, that gorgeous green iconic moth. Looks like it's from another universe. It's amazing. <laughs> it's- I, I remember seeing those all the time oh, when I was younger. They're gorgeous, and they only they, you don't see them very much because they need one particular tree. Mm. That's it. If that tree dies, they die. That's what they mean by coevolution and coextinction, which is the opposite. Mm. Right. So my philosophy, following that, is that these sacred plants and fungi have we have coevolved with them, and without them, we are lost. We've gotten lost. I recently have been doing a lot of ancestral work, and on my mother's side, I did a, did these wonderful fancy DNA tests. I sprung for them because they were just so much deeper than the, the ones out there that you could just you know pay a couple hundred bucks and get some yeah. idea of ancestry. This goes it goes all the way back to primeval times. What company did you use? I've, I'm not following that too closely these days. I believe it's DNA Plus. Awesome. Okay, but I want to make sure I'm getting that right. Um, they're really interesting and they're all into educating as well. And the guy mm. who found it and studied the classics. Mm-hmm. And so he has a real understanding of where these, these different ancient worlds coming together and where the DNA came. And, you know, it's very controversial because DNA doesn't lie. You know, you could have a family line, for example, a family tree. Well, there's certainly going to be some love children in there, for example. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. And DNA will tell you that, okay? And I just think it's wonderful. So I don't have any issues, but other people do. You know, so it's it's um it's very tricky. But I wanted to know for sure. I got the, all these. I was doing all this research into my mother's side, and I just needed to know. I kept getting these little pieces of historical information, like uh, recorded history. They say. Mm-hmm. And there were things like there was an Artemis temple in my village. Oh. Well, I, knew, I knew the village exactly where we came from, and they had been there thousands of years, and they were very, very proud, but they all had to come to the United States because of war and civil war and another war, and it just went on and on for them. All right, the Balkans is quite war-torn. And yeah. <laughs> Greek ancestry, right, in case people didn't know. Artemis uh, yeah, is a is Greek, Greek deity. Yes, thank you. This is Greek, and it is this village was pre-Greek and I'd never heard the term pre-Greek and that really blew my mind. And yes, there was, there was cannabis present. Did you say Cree, Cree, K-R-E-E or pre, P-R-E? Pre as in before. before right, there was- it's super interesting. Yeah, there were definitely people in the Balkans before like Greek culture made it. Uh, I've been studying the, you know, Socratic era, pre-Socratic stuff for a while. So the, the okay. Greek history is really important. To it all that. is important, and there's a lot of interesting stuff back then. When you go back that far, I encourage everybody to do some some really interesting, like deep work on your ancestors. And if you don't know, if you're adopted or your family just didn't care about that, or you're just, you know, they they mm. immigrated so long ago, or whatever, maybe they were brought over as slaves. I mean, whatever, however your your you know more recent ancestors came to the United States, because everybody came to the United States unless you're Native American, right? Yep. When you came from somewhere, where where was it? And what were your people? And what were they doing? Because they all did some sort of ceremonial spirituality back then. And most religions back in the day were nature based. So they were if there was anything psychoactive or psychedelic, you know they're gonna find it. Right? And they were Absolutely. passing 
belong to each other. So I just thought, well, what is mine? What is mine? This is interesting. Pre-Greek, what's that? So I started looking, well, where was that? Well, I knew about the Minoan civilization and I knew about the Mycenaean civilization. The My, um, Mycenae is much closer to my village than, than uh, Crete, but they're mm-hmm. all very, very close. Very close, okay? So I thought all of the things that my yaya and papu, that's grandmother and grandfather, they would say to me, and the the fact that all of the people from that village were so proud, they would call it Arakova, but Arakova is the Turkish name, and the Turkish rule was like 450 years, and it was brutal. I may have my numbers wrong. I'm still like, I didn't grow up with this stuff. I'm picking all this up as I go. I'm learning. But the Turks had the Greeks for a very, very long time, and they were they were brutal rulers, and they knew, if you spoke Greek, you risked your life. So they were teaching the children their own language in the caves, so they wouldn't be killed. Okay. Mm. And they were also, you know, forced to become Christians. And that's also extremely controversial because most of my relatives are Greek Orthodox. I'm mm. talking about before the conquerors, before the colonizers, because that's what they are. That's what they were. Right. Even before- and the Greeks were like, also, you're kind of pointing to in this way, Zoe, like they're pushed out of their territory, which was more around Istanbul, a little south of Istanbul, I think. Um Oh yeah, oh yeah, Turkey. Tur- what is Turkey? Um, right. What is Turkey today was Greece then. Yes, absolutely. But yeah. I'm, then go way back from that. That's just in the last mm-hmm. thousand years. Go now another thousand, another two, another three, another three and a half, and now you've got the Minoan civilization and the Mycenaean civilization. And what not everyone knows is that they were working with sacred plants and they were working with them a lot. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. This is you know this is we often kind of minimize it in the West to say it was, I think it's a simple explanation to say it was just the rites of Eleusis, the Eleusinian mysteries, but there had to have been like easily 50 to a hundred more different psychedelic using cultures in that same region. Of course there were. And that was just the big one that made it through history and Mm -hmm. was known, you know, I mean, and one of the things I learned recently about that, but well, first of all, let me just go back. I don't think a lot of people understand that that actually originated in Crete and then it started to move around. It was just that these were the indigenous Greeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were the first Greek and they were very advanced. They're pretty much thought of as the first real civilization in Europe, whatever that really means, but they were, (laughs) I mean, do a little homework and you can tell they were super advanced (laughs) and they were all tripping. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's got, I mean, I really see that that had to go together, okay? It just is, is rational, right? So also one thing I noticed, is, and this is a big thing, and it goes back to DNA. So there was a, this is how I found this guy who does this specialized DNA. And I found something about the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, and it basically said that in 2015, which is not long ago, <laughs> There was a major change in how we were able to tell um, through DNA technology, and I believe it had to do with computers. And they discovered something that probably hurt a lot of archaeologists and anthropologists' career because they've been debating for a very long time, hundreds of years at least, on whether the Minoans and the Mycenaeans were the same genetically. Well, make a long story short, 2015, they discovered that they, in fact, were identical. Mm. with the same same people. Now, much more recently, they discovered a um, two also new technology, kind of it's sort of like a drone that flies over, I think, and it sees it can find things in the mm-hmm. uh, in in the earth that Oh, right, it's like a ground penetrating satellite radar. Um it's really interesting and they're finding all sorts of really ancient temples uh Thank that <laughs> it's like validating Graham Hancock's whole thing. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. As he said, shit just keeps getting older. I love that. I, that's his like tagline now for me. Stuff just keeps getting older. <laughs> I've really enjoyed them. We've we've um, done some like peyote ceremony together, and they're just Great. really lovely, lovely people. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So and Santa, that's his wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got to meet them when I was running events in Boston in a uh, Chinatown. Oh, uh, it was wow! Really fun. Was fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they came out and like gave a talk. Boston, really of that. I mean, we can yeah. digress. We could do this all <laughs> night. So 
the point I'm trying to make is like I was on this shit and I was also, you know, definitely exploring with cannabis. Okay. Mm-hmm. Edible. So I, I was doing medicine work. It was ancestral healing. I was on a mission. I think Chris was in, oh, I don't even know. He was off somewhere medicine hunting for a couple of weeks. So I did this while he was away into the dark of the night. And I just went down into the catacombs of Google and I'm really, really good at searching from my high tech days and I can find really super obscure things. And then I started to put them together like pieces of a puzzle because you'd have this kind of person exploring um, plants and this kind, you know, where they migrated and this person over here doing DNA analysis and this person over here doing art. And you just start seeing the patterns. And it was so obvious to me by the time I put the two together, the Minoan and Mycenaean cultures together, it was mind boggling to me that it, we, that it hadn't been more widely known mm. um, that these people were obviously working with psychedelics. I mean, hello, how can you miss the symbolism in the art? It's, it's just, don't get me started. This is a patriarchal thing. You understand all these people were male. There were no female anthropologists back then. Right. Of course. You know, females were lucky if they got an education. So I also found this. So this is the deal. So the next big thing that happened over there was they discovered two new tombs. They weren't new tombs. They were ancient tombs, but nobody knew they existed. And they were a really big deal. And they were of the Minoan period. However, they were in like the Mycenaean area. It's like written music, you mean? Uh, there were two big tombs. Um, one oh, was tombs. Called, so like underground tombs, category. Okay. Tombs, tomb, T-O-M, yep. yes. Yeah, tombs. all right. And um, one was called the, oh gosh, I didn't really study up for this, but the Griffin Warrior, I believe. Mm. They found so much beautiful material that we'd never seen before from that period was iconic from that period clearly clearly the same okay it's like no difference at all the painters the beautiful work with the with the gold all of it it's exactly the same kind of art but new art to us (laughs) and it one of the things that's mind-boggling is this ring signet ring which was their way of of it was kind of part of their commerce was you'd stamp with your fancy ring and that meant money (laughs) so the, <laughs> interesting yeah, it's, okay. kind of cool. it's like we're reverting back to that aren't we mm. you know, our our phones you know yeah absolutely <laughs> but they had these rings and these rings had super detailed teeny gold um bas relief sculpture on it bas relief is when it's flat and there's something rising out right so that kind of sculpture sculpture on it so these rings have all, they depict all sorts of things. And one of them, you keep finding these medicine women. And we know they're medicine women because of the tombs we already knew about in Crete. But one of, the, one of them has these women, these medicine women are in some kind of a static dance. And they have, their heads have turned into something that looks certainly a lot like ergot. Mm. Like an artistic depiction of ergot. What else it could possibly be is beyond my comprehension. And how somebody would try to twist that obviousness into some other explanation to avoid having to explain the psychedelic aspect of it is just silly. I mean, I don't know what else it could be. And everything else in these things are exactly right. Like if it's a botanical, you know what it is. It's good art. So I think that... That was a very clear thing. If anybody was still wondering whether they were using ergot in their brews, well, I think that that ring is enough. I really do. But if you really want to still argue it, okay, but it looks like ergot to me. Um, and I, I was blown away by that. And I was also blown away by they almost were all women. The medicine women were women. Mm. I still have yet to see a medicine man. Maybe there is one. And I'm not saying that men can't be really wonderful uh, shamans or healers or ceremonial facilitators. Do you mean like living a medicine path or how do you mean it? Medicine women like ceremonial women who, you know, who held ceremony. Maybe they were also, there were prophets or prophecies, some of them. Right. Like Orphic. um, You know, yeah. People you went to Mm -hmm. and people who led ceremony. I mean, these are, 
they're very early. They're also, there's one called the poppy goddess, which is fascinating to me. Uh, she mm-hmm. has a crown of poppies and they're not poppies. They're the poppy that where the opium is, right? The, mm-hmm. the, that's the pod, okay. And her crown is clearly that again, it's anatomically perfect. Hmm. Everything is perfect. So I, I just keep looking and I keep finding, and here's the thing. I already knew that they were otherworldly. The culture was otherworldly. And I feel that in my, my own deepest, deepest self. Mm. That was the draw way before I was in the psychedelic field. But being able to go back and prove that genetically that's where I'm from, that was somehow extremely liberating to me and healing. It was what I hear from so many other people, so many cosmic sisters talk about ancestral healing. It was so clear to me that that was helping me, empower me, free me. And it was also this big sadness that came over me, all that was lost and how lost that part of my tribe is. You know, like this, the Greeks are still very tribal, very proud, very wonderful people for the most part. Obviously, there's some, some people aren't going to be perfect in any tribe. I don't care what tribe it is. There are a lot of really great people who are originally from Greece or their ancestors are from Greece. But unlike all different immigrants, the Greeks, where they go, still consider themselves Greeks. They're yeah. very, very tri- I mean, it's funny, right? You can easily make that a comedy skit, and people have. And I always thought it was a hoot that they were so tribal. And it, it used to be that if you were from a village, that was your tribe. And if you married outside of that village, it had to be for some reason. It was not something people mm. did. But they were tribal. Like the common example is just Greece and Sparta, or sorry, Athens and Sparta. Like that rivalry is really interesting. Yeah, our village is sort of right in the middle. <laughs> oh, really? It's a very close to Eleusis. It's like, a, what, a day walk or less? Well, it's um, a very, very interesting village. And I, like, I didn't realize we were going to talk about this, but since we are, <laughs> I mean, I could, I could do this on my dad's side, but not as much. I'm just starting mm-hmm. that journey. But my mom is full indigenous Greek. I mean, if there's anything else in, in there, it was because of somebody who came through town. And it maybe wasn't a love thing. Got it? Right. So they, this, because of where the village was situated, it, it was a destination point. Well, why would it be a destination point? Because I'm brought up thinking we were just little peasant people, okay? Because that's what we were forced to become, just like any indigenous people that gets taken over, right? They're, they're looked at as people of the earth. Well, they are people of the earth. They were all farmers. They lived off the land and they still do. And it's beautiful there. But it's not like, it's not like a bat. It was looked on with a classist approach mm-hmm. as opposed to, wow, these people know what to do. They're all living past a hundred. They, they, you know, without any so-called modern medicine and they're, you know, they're, they have all the food you could ever want and clean water and good teeth. I don't even know how that happened. I think it just, just must be the water. I mean, they were living a beautiful life for the most part. Okay. Mm. So, so here's what I, I, I just had to know what, all these different things that I kept finding during that, remember, stretch of at least 3,000 and a half years, at least that long. Within that stretch, there were periods of time. And this is important because people are talking about decolonization. So hold on and, and just hear me out. But colonization goes back and then goes back again and then goes back again. It's very complicated. It's not just decolonizing the United States of America. It's decolonizing from all the colonizers. Colonizing forces have been on this planet since the beginning of time, in, in little ways, in medium ways, in big ways, and it's still going I'm on. Thankful you said that, Zoe. Like people just always want to point to North America, and it's like, no, this is a worldwide and very historic phenomenon. This is exactly so kind of like baked into our DNA in, in some cases, unfortunately. Yes, but I, I really appreciate that. Like, how do we reclaim our history? Well, you know, and it's a, co- a complicated subject, but it's very important to me, you know, like, I, and it's important to a lot of people, you know, and it does relate back to Black Lives Matter in, in so many different ways. Yeah. So hear me out. So basically, I kept finding these little pieces, these jewels from my village, and it started to really upset me. 
But I was like, we were hoodwinked. My mother's family was hoodwinked into thinking they were little peasants from a village that came over dirt poor because they, they had been destroyed by so many different outside forces, including Hitler. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it just was one after another, after the fall of Greece, which was the Romans took them over. That's another story. Okay. But that was, those were the first colonizers. However, they weren't. That's the interesting thing. The first colonizers were the ones that came in and took the indigenous Greeks and made them what most people think of as ancient Greeks, the Hellenic Greeks, the Olympian Greeks were not the original Greeks. They were colonizers. Got it? Ref, I, I would like to say refugee slash colonizers because the Turks pushed them out of their home. I don't but know if that was the right time period. They I'm thinking like 3,000, like before Plato by like 1,000, 2,000 years. Okay, well, let's just say this. Yeah. From what I gather, and this could be all bullshit, but it doesn't seem like it. Mm -hmm. The indigenous Greeks were mostly okay about it. They were like, mm -hmm. come on in. Do you need food? That's my understanding. It seems sensible. Yeah. Like there was plenty of land at that point. There weren't enough people to like, there wasn't enough food to make enough people. And they um, did mix, you know? Yeah. So, and then that, you know, the, the, the people who, who came in took a great deal of what had already been created culturally by the indigenous Greeks. And then they embraced it and made it their own, which hmm. people, they would call cultural appropriation. <laughs> right. which it was, but it was also done beautifully. It was really more cultural evolution because, you know, but, but, you know, it was also very different and it led to patriarchy. So you got to, you know, when you look at history, you just really start seeing these patterns and you start to, to look at a lot of what is being talked about in our culture and our psychedelic culture and subculture, things like decolonizing, which again are very, very important to me. So I just want to put this out here. In my opinion, it's not the first time I've said this publicly, the really taboo subject is what is the, at the bottom of the colonizers most people are referring to in our scene. They're talking about more modern times. So the Absolutely. Big, the big ones, Britain, Spain, Portugal, um, the Dutch. And Brutal. who am I missing? Who am I missing? French. Uh, French yeah, the French, French as well, yep. Okay. So, and, 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 I, I, you know, all of these had, all of these big, big colonial forces had what in common? Mm, patriarchy. They had patriarchy, but they had something else that goes together with patriarchy. Oh, Christianity. Thank you. Whew. <laughs> oh, you're speaking my language. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Well, I, think, <laughs> I, I think quite a few people are coming to these conclusions because you know what? They're facts. This is a fact. Mm. So when you really start to open up and look and you want to get it, you're kind of like, uh, yeah, but what is a, what do they mean by the colonies? What are, who are the colonizers they're talking about? Okay, let's look at them. Who are they? How did these people think? How did they get to a point where they believed they were better than the indigenous people that they killed or enslaved? Mm -hmm. or Made indentured servants, which depending on who they were, okay, because Irish didn't fare well either, for example. <laughs> right. And that's a lot of my lineage is Irish, Scottish. We were very brutalized. And yeah. that's on my dad's side, on one one of his sides. So oh, I, yeah. Nice. <laughs> I'll fix another. You could go down the same path if you wanted and look at all this fantastic pre Christian Celtic. Oh, it's amazing. Um, oh, Irish it, history is unbelievable. It's incredible. It's incredible. And all of that was lost, almost all of it, because of the Brits. Yeah, which is interesting. I, you know, I want to say Brits, but I want to say like post-Roman colonized Brits. Like, so it's like a leftover of Roman Empire culture. Let's look at the Romans. This is the Ugh. deal. Okay. <laughs> they took over Greece. Okay. They, they destroyed Greece. And they took all of the stuff that Greek had, Greece had created. They're the great cultural appropriators. And that's not all. We're just going to start with what they took from Greece. They took from Greece and they made it their own. And it was not a good change. It was like taking 
a Van Gogh or let's say actually, let's say an Alex Gray painting because he's cool. Let's take Alex Gray and let's do an old fashioned Xerox copy, black and white. And what's it going to look like? That's how bad the appropriation was when the Romans took the Greek gods and goddesses. It was just tacky what they did. Okay. So when Mm. people want to talk about Venus and, you know, I, I I get on their cases about that. Like, don't call her Venus, call her Aphrodite. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Greek names, please. You know, it's, don't call her Venus because Venus is a, is a, is a terrible version. It's a patriarchal version by another culture. It's appropriation. It's no different from other occult appropriation people talk about all the time. I feel that. I really feel that. And I get pretty fired up about it at this point <laughs> because I have done some history. So, okay, then the Romans were done with that. And, all, you know, I, I am not an expert in this part of history, but then they appropriated my dad's side. <laughs> You know, not the Scottish side, but the Jewish side. My dad's Scottish Jewish. Mm. And they decided that they would be Christians, but they, you know, took that religion and changed it too. I mean, think about what they did to to Jesus. I mean, if Jesus even existed, he was, you know, a sweet talking Jew. I mean, and a dark skin one, I'm sure. And he, you know, whether or not he was actually the son of God, you know, I'm I'm an agnostic, so I won't go there, but The point is that the Romans took that and made Roman Catholicism, and then they wanted to spread that around the world. And by spreading it, it was forced. It's not like they went and convinced people, oh, this is what you should be. This is what you should believe. I'm sure there was some of that, but we know what really happened. And, Mm -hmm. and And they went around destroying temples. And that... We look at what, what is left of, of Native culture, say, in the United States. We know about some of that history. It's horrifying history, and it's much more recent. When I go into, at, at, when we go to Spirit Plant Medicine in Vancouver, they have an amazing anthropological museum. It's just mm. not to be missed. But you go in there and you get this, on the one hand, this like, overwhelming sense of how extraordinary human humans the human species can be and how what greatness is within us creatively you know you see this art that's just so gorgeous and then you get this crushing feeling of of just grief of so much loss and so in such brutal horrifying wrong ways and it's just like that when i go to a greek um you know, like see Greek antiquities. I feel the same way. And you know where they all are, right? I've Most- seen a lot of them at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but okay, I don't not. really know they where the rest of them are. Most of them are in Britain. Mm. Yep. Yeah. I, I know there's a big, actually, like global lawsuit. Uh, I think there's a <laughs> lot of lawsuits happening from like Egypt and, and Greece and other places to reclaim those artifacts. And I think it's happening across Africa as well. Yeah, and it's so past time, and London should just say, hey, you know, we've held these for a good long time. We took them at a different time period where we, you know, we we thought we were better than everyone, and so we thought that, you know, we would take the savages' art and make sure that they didn't destroy it, and we'd take better care of it because we're so much more sophisticated, and then we're just going to steal it, and we're going to keep it. I'm not like anti-British and I mean, I, I, I just want us to claim, like, be honest about like the blood on everybody's hands. Like in Europe, there is so much blood on our hands and same thing here in the U S it's like, you guys are just as guilty as we are. Oh yeah. Um, If not more, like your genocide was really atrocious. Oh God. It just goes on. But you know, you go back to that taboo subject of what's in common, what the colonizer have in common. And a lot of my indigenous friends have come to this conclusion and that feels really good because to me, that's a path to freedom. Um, if you, if you were, your people were almost entirely wiped out by a, a group of people or forced to be slaves or all of the above, why would you want to follow their spirituality? Mm. I, I really feel, and it will upset a lot of people, and I'm sorry about that, but the, the, it doesn't make sense to me. If you're on the decolonizing path, the, you can't keep 
the colonizer's spirituality. If you're going to talk about the other things that you're getting rid of, great, great. Get rid of that shit. You know, all the shit we've been taught about, including patriarchy, you know, mm. and all of the racism, all of that, colonizers. I mean, it's very convenient when you want to take over a group of people for whatever reason to just sort of start splitting people up and telling one group that they're better than another group so that there's a hierarchy. There's a movie, if you haven't seen it out, I really recommend it called The Nightingale. Mm, no. I think it does a really beautiful job expressing that. It's a beautiful and really hard to watch movie. And it's coming out mm. of Australia. It's about the Ab- Australian Aborigines and at a time also when um, a lot of Irish were being sent down there as criminals, but they weren't really, a lot of them were just fighting to survive and they'd be like petty thieves. And they were sent down to Australia. They were supposed to be able to work off their debts, but they all often could never get out. And it was just, you know, excuse my French, it was a shit show. Mm -hmm. And they did a beautiful job. This is one of those movies you should not miss, especially if you're interested in decolonizing or looking at the past. I'm in. Oh, and man. anybody of Irish descent should watch that movie. Mm. Really. Okay. Cause it, I thought they did a brilliant job. So I, this stuff is really interesting to me because I too feel that my ancestors, I'm, again, I'm talking about my mom's side, but this could totally go the other way. The Scottish and the Jewish. Okay. I could, I could go down those paths as well, but on the Greek side, when we came over to the United States, it was all about assimilating. You know, it was like how, you know, and and a lot of that was really loving. I mean, it it turned out that at least my tribe was really into being American. Like they thought, oh, you know, we're going to come, we're going to start over. This is a new country and we have, you know, the world is our oyster. We're going to, we're going to do well. We're going to thrive here and we're going to rebuild. It was very, very hopeful people. Right. But in the process of doing that, on the one hand, they held on to some culture. With, with just a hilarity, really, you know, uh, like, you know, I grew up, you know, it was the Greeks and, and the Americans. And before that, it was the Greeks and the white people or the black people. And that's it. And if you were from another country, you might be like the Mexican people or the, you know, they, I mean, they were very interested in where you were from if you were from somewhere else because they were immigrants, right? So this was all loving, but it was still super tribal, which is really kind of hilarious. But it was, and it still is. And so what would happen was you were Greek or you were someone else. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, in the outside world and the way they dress and the way they you know, learn to speak and do the things they did, they all assimilated. And then the only other piece that they held on to as Greek was Greek Orthodox, which to me is not Greek. And I would say this is the same for many others, especially in South America. But again, this is a taboo subject. It's going to upset a lot of religious people. And I don't mean to upset anybody. All I'm saying. It comes in with the Roman Empire and the splitting of the Roman Empire. It's nothing to really do with indigenous Greek culture whatsoever. um, And you follow those main colonizers that the indigenous people here in the States are talking about. They all come from that line. Like even Mm. if it's France, it's it's still religious. I mean, not one of those people were not thinking... Again, that, that something in their spiritual belief system, because that's what it is, taught them that they had superiority over fill in the blank, including women, since this is psychedelic feminism, right? And, you know, we get to that. People don't like to talk about male supremacy, but that's what it is. If you think a female is less valuable than a male, then you are a male supremacist. That's the end of it. That's it. That's what male supremacy means. It means thinking that the, the other gender or gender is, as it turns out, are less than. They're not as important. The boy baby's more important, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> you, know, I, right. it, it, you know, let's call it what it is. And it's just absurd, as absurd as racism. It, there's no science. I mean, they thought there was science. I mean, the, the science of the day, you know, which is still prevails, sadly, was that that it was science <laughs> that these things were were true you know that, that the men were more intelligent than women and that was just right no. right i mean and it, you know 100 years ago to this 
this year the women finally got the vote in the United States. And oh, by the way, that was just white women. Yeah. And it was, it you know, they had the right to vote, but it didn't mean that it was like it smiled upon in their homes, right? Like, oh, I think you. a lot of women probably got beaten for going to vote. Well, um, they got killed. beaten before that, too. So, true, yeah. true. I mean, it was not illegal until I believe 1970. You could, oh my God. You could write your life legally. That's horrifying. Oh, yeah, 1970. Ugh. (laughs) Yeah. I know it's, 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 you know, people don't realize how this wasn't long ago. And this, this is the foundation of, of our nation, the United States of America, and many others as well. This patriarchal rule, see, there's nothing wrong with a patriarch, a ma- a, like a father, right? Or, or the father of the family. That's sweet. I got a wonderful dad. Both my granddads were great. It's This is about a system, right? Patriarchy as a system. That is not an individual or individuals. That is a system that is in place. And it comes from male supremacy. If it didn't, then we could just end it. It would just be over. It, but it's impermeated. It's in the fabric of who we are as, as you know, a culture. It's ingrained. It's in, and it's literally like the foundations of a building. You know, like how the hell do you redo the building if the whole foundation is male supremacist and sadly white supremacist as well here in the United States. But in other countries like Africa, they fought each other too before there were any white people, mm. and so there were different types of hierarchies there as well that weren't white black. And if you go to another country where they have a sort of beautiful, darker toned skins, there's all kinds of colorism that goes on there. But you could argue that came from white supremacy and trickled down. And I think that's probably true in most cases. I just know that people have always othered and that's a human trait. And if we keep on doing that, you know, I mean, othering people with differences, right? Making them less than. As yeah. a result, like, oh, because you're not a lawyer, uh, it, it could be in the professions, it could be race, gender, all sorts of different differences, right? Yeah. And, you know, we haven't even talked about ageism or classism. Classism is huge in a lot of countries. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, Zoe, like uh, the idea of peasants and like yeah. rich people must like wealthy, wealthy billionaires must look down on everybody as peasants, like very regularly. Oh, yeah. We're plebs for sure. We're and it's like uh, they're they're kind of like feeling this uh, this thing of the white man's burden that yeah. has been talked about, and it's just kind of morphed a little bit. Well, I think we're we're the help, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, it's true, you know, and and that all you know all blurs together because it stems from the same sort of ill-conceived ideas that are all antiquated and and very hateful, actually. And have caused a great deal of suffering. But, the, you know, racism, sexism, ageism, also ableism, which is something I'm more and more interested in because I've always thought about it, but I never knew the term until relatively recently. So like people in wheelchairs, stuff like that? Yeah, but it's bigger than that. It's sort of the idea of assuming that someone is completely able-bodied or able-minded also. Right. I'm seeing my body collapse at a pretty early age. <laughs> Honestly, I was like this uh, rock climber, uh, oh. like doing all sorts of extreme sports, and I'm just like collapsing. So this idea of like ableism is becoming really big for me, and um, it's How really interesting. Uh, Thirty-eight, maybe. Okay, but you're feeling you're feeling that you pretty much push your body to the limit. I wore it out, and I think I'm having some interesting um, reactions. Uh, to the modern world, various poisons that are out there. So <laughs> we don't need to go into that. But yeah, it's like wearing it out plus bad reactions to uh, the environment. I'm sorry to hear that. And oh, thank you. It's not going to get better. It'll. <laughs> you're, you're, you're so far yeah. no, no, it's true, though. As we get older, we definitely start to wear out no matter how well you take care of yourself, especially mm. if you've in your youth and done what you really love like rock climbing or dancing or many other things oh yeah there's you plenty know, of them you'll wear out in different ways but there are also people who are born with different um types of like people who are blind or deaf and they find ways in if they're lucky if they're privileged enough to have really great uh technology and good teachers and and sort of be able to you know 
kind of if you're born in that situation and everything goes well for you, you can have an amazing life. And one of the companies, it wasn't a company, it was a non nonprofit that was a big part of my world during that high tech time was called Very Special Arts. And that's where I learned most of what I learned about the different types of what they called disabilities. The language changes constantly. So mm-hmm. I really don't know what, I'm sure there are many different people who would, who would be able to give us better words. And I've been thinking about this too. Like, where is, where are those people in psychedelics? Like that is an underrepresented group too. I've, I've really thought about the fact, like, um, you might've run into Caitlin. She's part of cosmic sister and she's really cool. And her brother, younger brother was born deaf mm. and a remarkable young man. I've not met him, but I've heard and I've watched him on social media and he's really cu- quite astounding what he's like doing whatever he wants with his life. And he's quite talented in many ways. Okay. Um, I think about the fact that if he came to spirit plant medicine or one of these conferences, we don't have anybody who's interpreting, you know, we Mm -hmm. just assume that everybody who's going to come to these conferences can hear. I'm going to a conference. Um, when is it? I think it's in January. It's online. And this is the first one I've seen the um, ASL people being highlighted and, and we're being told awesome. that there's ASL interpreters. I'll pull up the name of it. It's, uh, it's like psychedelics and madness or something like that. It's, uh, well, I want to know because they deserve kudos for that. Yeah, it's the first, honestly, the first time I've seen any kind of like shout out. Um, yeah. Here's what it's called. Psychedelics, madness and awakening, harm reduction and future visions. Uh Wow, Lily that's... is Lily Ross, Lily K. Ross in Cosmic Sister. Oh yes, that's she'll awesome. be on a panel with me. I Good think. For her. Yeah. Um, well, I'm very impressed by that, and we need more of that. And I know <laughs> yeah. that a lot of it is about money. That you know, so many of these conferences really are just scraping by. But that's no excuse. Right, they're selling out, and we need to just charge slightly more so we can afford it. And people need to pay for that, or sponsors do, or yeah, something. We, we have to consider it. A, a part of the conference, you know? And I, I mean, when I started this work with the, you know, the grants, the early work with the grants was really because we would go to conferences and there would be just almost no women up there at all. Right. And so this is not that long ago, which is a very good thing because it makes me feel like our community actually changes quickly compared to the rest of the world. I, I have to say I'm impressed that we did. And we had to work at it, but we did it. I mean, when you go to most of these sites now for these conferences, they're mostly about 50-50 male, female. But you have to understand that's a very basic diversity dimension. That's right. Like, you know, like, you you know, first of all, gender is fluid, right? So what about people who don't really feel like they're either male or female or they're, you know, non-binary or, or gender fluid or queer or whatever word you want to use? Anybody, you know, that not everybody falls into male or female. And that that's another part of diversity that's been recognized as, as uh, underrepresented in psychedelics and people are doing really good work with that. Um, so I love seeing that because that's just what a shame to just not even not, not to celebrate that element. I mean, I come from the theater. So to me, it's it's a celebration. <laughs> I, I, I want that energy in, in the scene. I, it's, it's a ludicrous idea that they felt excluded in some way, uh, but it's true. Um, I, I have not seen a lot of, of um, I've seen mostly males. And then I, when, when forced through things like media and a lot of podcasting and other people talking about this issue, for whatever reason, the men in charge, and they are mostly men, did the right thing, and we managed to get about 50-50 male-female. All right, so after that, the next stage for me was to start to talk about within that, we need diversity. And diversity is not always black and white, as in black people or white people either. It's also times of life. It's also um, the type of expertise 
you know, it's the, the, what are they going to share? Are they going to share, you know, also about, if it's about psychedelics, which psychedelics are they expert in? Are they psychologists? Are they artists? Are they philosophers? What, what is their, you know, what is that? Like the, the diversity has dimensions, you know, but then that it was it was blatantly obvious to me too that there were almost no black people in psychedelics. That was very clear right away too because I don't come from worlds like that. That's just not my scene. So it was it was just kind of an obvious mm. and a shame. Um, but I, you know, there weren't a lot of people who were willing to come out at that time, and that's because of racial disparity. A lot of it, a lot of it. You know, you know, just these these. <laughs> these substances are illegal in many cases. So if you're black and living in the United States, maybe you don't want to risk that. Yeah. Like you don't really need a bigger target on your back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So mm-hmm. I know there are plenty of black people in the sixties and seventies indulging. I mean, look, Jimi Hendrix. Hello. Yeah, I love George <laughs> Clinton. I'm obsessed with George Clinton. Oh, amazing. Amazing. And I just, I just think Jimmy was a genius. Mm -hmm. also him yeah yes yeah so i mean you think about that and then you think about this lack of you know and it's not saying now i mean things have things have sort of broken out in psychedelics from black lives matter and i love it because it happened out in the world and then it happened in our scene and it's beautiful because it had to fucking happen it was i'm i'm sad that it took this second wave of black lives matter to push psychedelics conferences into doing the right thing uh, it, it took too long i've been pushing that for in years in terms of like statements of solidarity or just getting more um black voices on stage action how do you mean that getting more black people on stage oh, right 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 yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and not just that giving scholarships bringing people mm-hmm. in giving them um giving them voice lifting their voices get access access if not money Access and money is really important. You know, I mean, it's part of the privilege, right? So if you don't have any money, <laughs> but you have a great podcast like you do, or you have access to the, a big audience, which you do, you have more people of color on your show, you're giving them access. You're, you're lifting their voice. So that's action. I have plenty of really wonderful people to send your way, by the way. Can't wait. Let me know. Uh, but, you know, it's, and it's, it's true of the, the main stage, too. For me, it was like, get them up on the main stage. Just get them up there. And let right. them do their magic. Just get up there and work your magic and tell your truth and be kind. Loving and kind and hopeful. That's the only thing I ask anybody who gets a grant. It's like, speak your truth, but be ultimately loving, kind, and hopeful. Because nobody wants a total drag up there. We're willing to look at the worst shit because we're all medicine people, right? We like to, we know that the whole, often the psychedelic experience, not always, but often it's about looking at the hardest things, right? In faith mm-hmm. them and coming out the other side. But it's ultimately a healing exercise. It's hopeful, right? You're, you're, you're reverting. It should to be. <laughs> yeah. It's the ideal. Uh, I'm an idealist. And I appreciate that approach. It's really, really kind of nice to hear that that's kind of your, your take and your angle. It's very Greek. Mm. <laughs> you know that labyrinth symbol that everybody uses? The labyrinth symbol. The labyrinth symbol. It's the one they use in breaking convention amongst others. That uh, comes yeah. The kind of circle with the maze inside. Yes. It is a symbol that means the psychedelic experience of going in and facing your demons and coming out. Mm. That's Mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. I think Minotaur right away. That's it. The golden thread. It's exactly that. And yes, you can do that without psychedelics. Sometimes in life, sometimes life dishes you things that are so, so difficult that you do go inside and have to face something very, very hard and come out the other end. But with psychedelics, you can do it in a ceremony. And that is a metaphor for life that they, that was an integral part of their culture. It was so much so that it was on their coins. Mm. So, yeah, so that's how I see it. I'd see, you know, yeah, it's also fun. It's sometimes just fun to get high with your friends. That's, that's nice too. But intentional work with psychedelics is the thing for me. Mm, mm -hmm. Plant-based psychedelics specifically like ayahuasca. 
Definitely. But peyote too, and mushrooms too. And you can definitely journey with, with cannabis. And I do often, uh, I think all of them, you, you can take journeys and you can be intentional about it if you like, and you can go in and, and face something that's difficult or not. Sometimes it's not difficult. Sometimes it's really exquisite. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's a mix of both. Often it's a mix of both. Right. But yeah. I, I see what's happening with Black Lives Matter and other things, sexism, racism. The Me Too movement has also been huge in psychedelics and desperately needed to happen. Um, That was very big. And it's not like it's over just because it's not trending on Twitter. Right. Yeah. Right. People are getting a lot more courage to come forward, and I'm really thankful for that. It's um, definitely... Uh, yeah, it was long overdue. Like <laughs> I kind of wish this was happening in the fifties, but we didn't really have the internet, um, to we like not. <laughs> we allow not. that to happen. Yeah. Right. But, but I think that, you know, these things come in little, you know, in, in waves and sometimes there's a big wave and a big change and social change happens. And then we backlash and I'm just worried about the backlash that's coming for the psychedelic community. It concerns me. And we have this, uh, certain individual in the white house right now that you know could get in again Mm -hmm. right and like modeling misogyny from the top and what the imprint that leaves on a lot of men is really troubling and not to mention the trauma it leaves on a lot of women to just know that that kind of a predator is out there you know i um this really brings me to something that I wanted to share because I have no idea who's listening or or who's going to listen to all of this. This is a long conversation, but my work has come more and more into we're all in relationship with each other across the gender spectrum. Gender is a construct. I really think that's true. Um, And by that, I mean the manners that we're taught, the ideas that we're taught around that to kind of make us into something like to distinguish what it feels safer. That's a little boy. That's a little girl. They, that one has long hair. That one has short hair or whatever. That one wears blue. That one wears pink. These, these are very simplified versions. Mm -hmm. These things are all throughout our culture so deeply that they're everywhere. You can't get around those. And some of them are very damaging to males too. And I'm, I've been saying this for a while and working with some very wonderful men um, who are really interested in looking at what women have been looking at with psychedelic feminism, but looking at it from the perspective of what do you carry? You know, what are the wounds that you have being a male in a male dominated culture? What are the wounds? What's the conditioning? What's the unhealthy conditioning? How has it Mm. affected your life? How are your relationships? You know, and I'm doing the same sorts of things with males as I've been doing for so long with females. And it's just, it's just, I, I can't tell you just it's wonderful. It's one of the most wonderful things to come into my life for a long time. I'm very, very excited about it. Mm. Right. Especially like, I think psychedelics actually potentiate this kind of identity fluidity, like gender <laughs> identity fluidity. And it's like really an interesting thing to see kind of, um, open up. Uh, and again, we could go back probably to the ancient Greeks, like, uh, Uh, at least in the alchemical tradition, there was a lot of talk about like becoming somewhat androgynous, being able to embody all of it, but being kind of like fluid in that a little bit too. Yeah. And we don't really know where these lines are drawn because if you see in nature, you know, we have had these adorable little raccoon babies, this, this particular summer and since we're all we're stuck here on quarantine we're paying a lot of attention (laughs) and we've watched this one group of four siblings um and just you can really see which ones are male and female and and i know that's true of a lot of different animal species so there are certain things that maybe are sort of tend to be natural and then there are these other things that are taught clearly you know, how we stand, how we, you know, posture, how we, you know, manners, that's what you call it in the theater, you know, when you talk about a comedy of manners, right? It's it's uh, mannerisms, basically, but not just how you move your, your hand, but also how you stand and how you speak and where your head goes. And, you know, all of these things are manners, you know, so we're mm. taught that stuff. That is absolutely learned. 
And from a gender perspective, it, it's true in many cases. And like I said, you can't really tell where. But, but yeah, with the ancient Greeks, I mean, the god Hermes was definitely gender fluid. I mean, he, I, he sort of, what do they say? He, um, he presented as male, but um, his very archetype was fluidity. He's Mercury in the Roman tradition, right? So mercurial, that's Hermes is the original god. And he, you know, he, he was the quintessential communicator. So mm-hmm. he could communicate that he could do certain things. He could travel between worlds. He could go the upper world and the underworld, for example. And so, of course, he could also be various genders. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Right. <laughs> and he was right. a very important god and very wonderful. And I love him. <laughs> right. And many people could be intimidated by um, Hermes, but, you know, that's just, uh, it's so powerful. It's so I interesting. Very, very cool. And I think, yeah. you know, I mean, the internet is absolutely hermetic. It's a quintessential. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? So you think about that, and I'd say so are psychedelics in a lot of a lot of ways. I could go down, you know, I'm working on that. It's something I would like to do as a talk sometime. Is really looking at the the language of psyche, sort of, or the language of soul. Some people call it, but I prefer the word psyche. And the archetypes of ancient Greek, Greece, from the perspective of shamanic journeying, you know, from that. When you really look at some of these gods and goddesses, they're very clearly taking roles of what we're rediscovering today in ceremonial situations. For instance, you mentioned the Minotaur, right? Mm. Well, they're what most people don't know about because we live in a patriarchy and the males are always important, more important than females. Um, With that myth, the hero was was it at, at most a demigod. I can't remember his lineage, but he was not a god. Theseus, who's a great warrior. And he came to the, to, you know, the labyrinth had been many, many men had tried, many warriors had tried and failed to face the great, the great beast in the middle of the, of the labyrinth. But he was determined to do it because he, he was just this great, great warrior that never failed. Right? So that's the story. So he goes there, but what people don't know is he met the goddess Ariadne, who is a really, really beautiful goddess. She fell in love with him. And she said, if you take the end of this spool of thread, the thread of life, by the way, which is a big metaphor, I will hold the other end of it. And you can unravel it and walk into the center of the labyrinth. And I know you don't think you need it, You'll be able to find the end, but when you come out, that's the hard part. It's the coming out part. Just follow the string. I will be here. I will not leave until you are safe and out. And you can go in and then you can face that great scary beast and slay it, which he does. And he comes back and he follows the string. And for a while, they're together. And then he abandons her, as heroes often do. But then she ends up with Dionysus, who is infinitely cooler anyway, and also definitely psychedelic. So the point is that she kind of had that almost, um, you, you know, if you were a psychotherapist in psychedelics, you might you might be play an Ariadne type of a role. Or if you were an indigenous shaman or healer or, or Naya or whatever you want to call it, you know, your tradition calls a healer, you you might have that as well, where you, you know, or a trip sitter too. You know, I got you. I got you. But the metaphor is beautiful because it says you have somebody here who who loves you and is, is here for you. I will be your anchor. You go in. You deal with that thing. You go far, far in or far, far out and face the hardest part of your journey, right? And just knowing that there's someone there allows you to do it on a different level, I think. Mm. They knew that. They knew that way back then. And the reason is because they were working with psychedelics for a very, very, very long time. And we are just rediscovering the same thing. We're going to come to similar conclusions because guess what? We're humans. And they were too. And we haven't really evolved that much in terms of human, you know, the species itself. We really haven't. We're a bit bigger. We're not smarter. (laughs) (laughs) Right. You could take anybody from 
pre-Hellenic Greece and make them an astronaut, I believe. No problem. I think so. Probably Egypt too and other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but I think that these things are, are so part of the rediscovering and to me, ancestral trauma, because that was lost. And that upsets me because all of my, my extended family that I love so much was still very special, but really crippled by um, a foreign spirituality. Mm. And I know that to them is truly sacrilegious, but we're talking about, you know, what was it the other day? I shared this, I share these with Chris because they just like, you have to see this one. I think he shared this one to me. Um, it was, a, it was literally the Greek Orthodox Papa, some big priest d declared yoga to be incompatible with Christianity. <laughs> You know, I've been seeing this in uh, like Christian magazines since like the early 2000s when I was in, in my undergrad. I would just like pull it up and go, oh, my goodness gracious. This is what they're taking their time to write about. Um, it's really threatening to them. It's really. Yeah. Well, I think hmm. it's, it's hard to figure it out, but it's like a new form of introspection and a whole new religious structure that yes. they might try to adopt or explore. But they all talk about, like the magazines I was reading, were, they were talking about possessions, like oh, demonic yeah. possessions. Oh, yeah. the, the, Roman, the Roman guy, what was his name? This is before, this is even bigger. The, the, in, in the Vatican, he is the chief uh, exorc exorcism officer. That's awesome. Uh, that's yeah, a great right? title. I don't know. Now that's the title. But he said basically that yoga was of the devil, and uh, and that's all there was to it. It's just simply right. Yeah. I know. But you, when you look at something like that, it's just so absurd, right? Mm -hmm. but they're very right. powerful. They're very powerful people. Mm -hmm. And just by speaking out about them publicly, you know, that's a great privilege that the United States still sort of has. We as United States citizens still have freedom of speech, at least supposedly. <laughs> yeah, for now, for now. Uh, the right to assemble is becoming a little touch and go. Uh, yeah. It's a crazy time to be living right now, but it is in a lot of ways like the classic psychedelic journey. It is as a country, as a nation. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not alone with this is one of the most beautiful things to me. You know, I grew up in New Zealand half of my life and I still have a lot of really wonderful friends and family there, um, including a lot of indigenous people from New Zealand. Mm. And. I'm in touch with them a lot in social media. And so I love what they post, <laughs> you know, and my indigenous friends here in the, in the United States also post some great stuff. These are also women in our expert advisory board. So I keep up with their posts and, and I learn from their posts also try to keep up with it. You can't keep up with it because all the politics is different. It's very different from Maori than it is for somebody, let's say, I don't know. And, even different parts of the United States and Canada, you know, there's different, we're dealing with different countries and different histories, but it's still the same sad story that doesn't change. You know, these indigenous people were living there and along came these, you know, colonizers with their ships and their guns and their, you know, it's the same story over and over again. So I don't know why I was saying that. Um, I was in communication with them. What was it I was saying? Hmm. It's like this global situation is not just yeah. alone a crisis. I think we're not the only country in crisis. And Thank like, you. uh, it feels to me like there's this idea of ego death. Like this is happening globally mm. Mm. and we're going to have to die <laughs> as a, as a global <laughs> civilization, be born something new. I don't know what that looks like, but that's just the sense I get. I like that a lot. Yes. What I was saying about the, the reason New Zealand came in is even this also happened when Trump just got in and there was a women's march. That was the first time I saw this, where other countries marched in solidarity and took videos and put them up online. And so they were all the big news entities were playing them. And you'd see these like thousands and thousands of people across the world marching for us, mm. marching for us. And Black Lives Matter, it did it. They did it the same thing. I mean, in many countries, people marched. For us. Mm. And yet we're also in many cases dealing with their own racism in their country. So they were marching for themselves also. Like in New Zealand, the Maori are treated like black. That They're the black people of New Zealand. 
They're not mm-hmm. just the indigenous people. They're also the black people. A lot of them are very light skinned, but they're still Maori. You know, so they, they have the same kind of racism there. It's the same people that came and colonized us, came to the United States. Almost exactly the same people just a little later. Did you see the movie about the Maori boy orphan? Is this a new one? Something about the wilder people. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. That was, that was a darling movie. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Melted my heart. <laughs> Oh yeah, very lovely. They do some good movies. <laughs> they really, really do. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, these things um, sadly are all over the world. And of course, when we go to the Amazon, which we don't know when the heck we'll ever be able to go back down there. But you know, you want to hear a pet peeve? Um, I understand there is such a thing as cultural appropriation. I also understand that there is definitely such a thing as taking advantage of people who um, don't have the same means as you do. And in that case, just happen to be indigenous also. So going down to Iquitos, Peru, for example, to um, experience ayahuasca in the closest thing we have to traditional setting, picking the right center is extremely important. But if you do, then it's a beautiful relationship with indigenous people. And they appreciate being able to be full-time healers or to have a restaurant or to sell their art so that they can rise out of poverty because guess what? They are indigenous people who were taken over by colonizers, several different waves of colonizers, and they lived mostly in poverty. So this Mm. was a way to help lift them. And it, you know, the idea of, Ayahuasca centers and to ayahuasca tourists, quote unquote, going down and taking advantage. I know there was some of that because there are always going to be bad people. And there are also really crass, stupid tourists. There are. Okay. But most people go there as a pilgrimage. And if anything, are guilty of kind of romanticizing the indigenous people. You know, in this way that they're very ignorant, a lot of ignorance, where it's like, oh, they all want to run around in grass skirts. No, they want a cell phone. You know, I'm helping a young woman go to college. She lives, she's from a village. She's Shipibo. She wants to finish college, but with quarantine there, she has to work online. She can't afford it because there's no high speed in her village. She lives in the middle of nowhere. Okay. So this young woman is so bright and so into what she's doing and she wants to study she's studying forestry so she wants to help save the rainforest of her people so how can i not help her so i found a way and um she did too and she was like all on it she's like i found a guy who can install a satellite and we will have it of course it's all through google translate so it gets really amusing because we don't speak each other's language but basically she is the only one in her village ever to have high speed internet and she's getting her college degree. Right. Incredible. Yeah, it is. And what's cool is as this, you know, we don't, well, here's the thing. It's, it's, she tells me what's going on down there and it's not good. It's not good. So all the ayahuasca tourism, I hate that term, but all of that dried up because people had to leave the country because of a global pandemic. So what do you think happened to all those people and all their businesses? Mm. I mean, they don't have what we have. The market's closed. It's not good. So we got to, I hope that on the other side of this, there will be less talk about how it hurts the people in Iquitos to go to Iquitos to experience ayahuasca so that the money goes into their hands instead of somebody in another country that has nothing to do with them. Mm. Unless it's somewhere like, you know, Colombia, where it's also, it's part of their indigenous, you know, tradition as well. Mm -hmm. That's okay, but it won't be the same. It'll be a different tradition, but I've heard it's pretty wonderful. Um, So I haven't had not had that experience. I really look forward to it someday when this is all over. But what I'm saying is that people that we actually know, children who we've watched grow up, people who have we've seen get married, people who we've helped through college, people who we've been done ceremony with, who run centers, who run restaurants, these lovely people we know are now, you know, lucky if they got food. Mm-hmm. And, and who, ha- who has the money to help them? 
I just had to pick a couple of people specifically that I knew. I just had to say, these are the ones I'm going to support, which feels rotten, but I don't have that kind of money. Right. And I know right. what people are helping. There are a lot of other people who have truly been moved by ayahuasca, their ayahuasca experience, and they, and they are, are real givers and they understand sacred reciprocity. But like anything else, it needs to be consistent to really help. And that goes back to Black Lives Matter, I just want to say. You know, I hope people hold on to this change because you can't expect it. Let me just put it this way. It's not a trend. Anti-racism should not be looked at as another damn trend. It needs to be something we keep working on. You can't quit. The environment's the same. All the big things. They, mm. this, is a, this is, a, I think, a, um, a flaw in our culture that we have this idea it's a trait of our specifically American culture where we are really fickle with news items. Have you noticed that? In terms of like a story pops up and we forget about it really quickly. Like I'm super angry on Monday, but fine on Tuesday. Well, like remember when the Amazon was burning? Not oh that, yeah. Okay. It's still burning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but everybody was devastated by that as if that was the first time we'd ever seen the destruction of the Am- the great Amazon, the great Amazon, the, 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 the yeah, as if it's the not Amazon. being deforested actively. Um, I mean, yeah. it, it's been deforested act- actively for decades uh-huh. and people have been devoted their entire lives to helping it to save that Amazon. And it's still getting, I mean, it just was, it's just frustrating, you know, it's frustrating. And then it's, but at least people are realizing and they're donating money and they're harvesting their hurt. And then all of a sudden it's not a news item. So what happens, I think to American culture, and I've seen this is that somewhere in the back of their head, they think it's done. It's fixed. That got solved. Mm. It didn't. And that's the same with sexism. It's the same with racism. It's all with all of these big social and environmental issues should not be considered trends, mm. including in the psychedelic scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like let's always remember our history and remember what's happening around the world, I think is a great way to look at it. There's so many things still going like there there is actively slave labor in the world there's actively human trafficking in the world some places it's kind of legal and encouraged i think so like we can't forget this we can't it can't just be about us and we have to continue to fight you know people talk about feminism they say white feminism and these ideas about different types of feminists you know there's as many different types of feminists as there are different women we all, we're not all, we don't all think exactly the same thing. And that same thing plays out in the BLM world. Um, yeah. It's, it's huge. Like we have to understand the diversity is like inf- infinite, really. Right. So, you know, for me, I'm one of those feminists who are like, it, we're not, it's not over until all women are, are safe and all mm. women have, a, have, are treated with respect. It's not over. That's all women. Period. All females, actually, all females. And, it, and then, you know, on, just like with Black Lives Matter, some people say all lives matter. Yes, of course, all lives matter. Same thing with, with, with feminism. It's like, yes, of course, the males matter, too. And anybody in between or on the gender spectrum, okay? So anybody, all people matter, okay? They do, of course. But at the moment, these, you know, the, the females are really getting a really, really bad ride. <laughs> And in other countries, it's so extreme and it's getting worse, not better in most cases. And it's not something to sweep under the rug. And I don't think our community is about sweeping things under the rug. We're, again, I'm an idealist. I came, you know, I'm part of this field because I believe in the psychedelic healing journey. And it's not just healing, it's also empowerment and, and growth. You know, it's it's being a better person. I like to say a better citizen of Gaia, right? Mm, That's mm-hmm. the ideal, is to be a better person. And and if we, we have to do that for the whole, you know, all of these other problems are part of being a better person, is caring about these kinds of things. And no, you you know, it's it's easy to despair because there's so much happening, but you just do what you can. 
you know, when I said action, action can be small things too. And you can find a way. You don't have to say, oh, I don't have any money to donate. Well, then do something else. Support something through social media. That doesn't cost you anything. You know, right. educate your friends, host little film screenings. There's so Beautiful. many things you can do for free. And work on yourself. That's an yeah. action to do, you know, like read some more books, learn some more, take a class. You know, if you're a guy, take some real good women's studies classes. Get 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 started. Get a get a 101 there. A lot of men don't have 101. And they come to me with these questions, and I'm just like, wow, how did you manage to get into your 20s without having a single bit of understanding about how it's been for women in the past 100 years or 500 years or 2,000 years? Nothing. You don't know anything. Wow. How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's called privilege. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, a lot of my black friends will say the same thing about, quote, unquote, white people. There's a lot of people who don't do any history. We do need to do our do some homework. That is, an, and choosing not to is an action. It's like they say, absolutely, silence is an action too. You know, it's true. Mm-hmm. Silence uh, typically is uh, implying compliance and um, allowing it to go on. Yeah. So I, it's just uh, it's just helpful to get loud. Just get loud <laughs> and, and take skillful action. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I, I believe that I don't like this sort of call out culture when it gets really hostile. And I like, I do like truth, but I do think that, I mean, and I think that there is a place for that sometimes. Some people really do need to just be called out. But I think like, for instance, um, like being a raging male hating feminist, it's, it's not helpful to anybody and is a type of sexism. And I really do believe that. And I think that that will probably upset a lot of people, but I'm sorry, but I really feel that that's my truth. I feel that we're all in this together. We're in relationship with each other. And I don't personally like the idea of this sort of Wonder Woman island that's only female. Mm. It doesn't do it for me. (laughs) You know, that's not an answer. So I think that helping people to see where their privilege is, helping people to open up to their own, in this case, for, I can speak to feminism more, okay, because I'm not black. I haven't had that experience. I've had my own experiences with racism, but it's more subtle than what most black people have to deal with. But it's enough to have a good understanding, and it hurts, and it's hurt my life. But I've had uh, certainly had sexism my whole life, and so I can mm-hmm. really speak to that. And I know that may, uh, most males, not all males, but most males don't stop necessarily to really contemplate how they too have been harmed by the patriarchy specifically not by Mm -hmm. uh, not you know not saying the culture but specifically saying what we're talking about this male dominance hurts males too and my work has really moved in that direction Mm -hmm. i don't know how brave you are but i usually ask people a question just let's go for it okay cool so it's very simple Usually I ask females, it started out as a female only talking circle. So it would be, think of a time in your life. It doesn't have to be a major, major thing. Like it doesn't have to be like a serious, serious thing, but it can be whatever comes up for you. Think about a time in your life where you were treated in a way that was a negative. It was not a good thing for no other reason, but that you were female or male in a male dominated culture. Okay. So for you, it would be male. For me, it would be female. So again, a time in your life where you were treated in a way that was not good, that you did not enjoy for no other reason, but that you are male in a male dominated culture. Mm. Mm -hmm. What's coming up? (laughs) I'm thinking about stuff that might've come up in ceremony, like with, with other folks and just when someone gets really raw you know, and, and reacting like I, I downstream, I'm not taking it personally, but it's kind of like a lashing out at maleness in general. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was the recipient of that projection. Um, and it was pretty aggressive, but it's like, you know, that's just, you know, that's just psychodynamics. I think like, of course, something's going to come up like that. I think that's yeah. very, it's very interesting. No one's ever said that one before, but I know it happens a lot. I'm sure there's plenty of others too, uh, but 
you know, I don't, I don't try to play masculine and I, I try not to get into bad situations. So like, uh, I think that's part of it. I might not have had too many others. Well, I think that if you think about like I've had, I don't want to share other people's stories without their permission, but it's a surprising thing. And it could also be about social programming. That's usually the second question is the same question. Can you think of a time where your male programming in our culture did not really serve you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like it's so it's, that's like, I'm, I'm seeing like hundreds of examples. Um, yes. you know, one is just the idea that I'm supposed to work myself to the bone and like mm-hmm. how much physical damage that can cause and emotional damage that can cause. And like, um, is my only value like economic? Ah, there you go. That's a good one. <laughs> right. It's a, it's a problematic situation for sure. I think like that. But see, now I think that the, the, when you frame it in the in the patriarchy, you know, it has a different light because it's not so much like, well, we have we have our shit too as males in our yeah, you do. <laughs> so we're all in this together. So we need to do something about it because we're in relationship with each other. It, with each other. So you're you're saying something that I, I use often use as an um, example when I'm explaining to women what we this thing of. You know, where men often first thing they think of when they want to say, you know, that they're dating a new woman is how pretty she is. Okay. That's like the number one most valued thing for a female in our typical mainstream culture. For a man, it's usually how much money he makes. So those two things are both very, very fucked up. Right. Inextricably linked, really. Yes, they are. And you get these incredible these insane kind of like heightened versions of that. We have that in the white house right now. We do. Oh yeah. Yeah. So these are, these are just some examples of many, many, many. And I, the, the bringing the psychedelic part into it is cool because it's like, you could, we could do this without anything. But if you get a bunch of people together who are willing to go there together, not separated, as you know, separated is really important sometimes too. I really think that's, that's true. But bringing everybody together in one group and having this, you know, going around talking about is sharing these kinds of examples is very revealing. And then at the end of that, usually I say, okay, when you talked about that feeling like you work yourself to the bones, you know, what's the emotion there that comes up for you? Mm. Yeah, it's like a devaluing um, and feeling not as worthy as I might uh, want to feel or like, um, yeah, I just, I, more towards being a peasant than like being a valuable human. I think hmm. like a worker be in the field maybe. Yeah. yeah. But that's more about classism than being a male. Right. Yeah. Like anybody can feel like that for sure. And women are definitely work to the bones, but the thing with the male yeah. is that you're prized by how much money you make a lot by a lot of women. It's not, I mean, like I was never that way, but it is a prevalent kind of a thing in our culture for sure. Right. So, I mean, the emotion that you carry in that, the, and it might be exhaustion, actually, <laughs> there might be some exhaustion there. Yes. It sounds like oh, it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So whatever those things are, like I encourage people to take that up in the medicine space the next time you journey and really, really explore it. Because there's mm. stuff there and whatever else you do with the medicine and, you know, oftentimes we'll try to attack something head on. Like I have depression, I have anxiety, I have an eating disorder, I have a this, I have a that, I am an alcoholic, I'm a, whatever you're dealing with. Often we go, we try to go like, I want to see the root of that problem. And sometimes that, that works sometimes. Mm. But I'm saying that one of the roots that we're all sharing is that we're part of the patriarchy. And patriarchy is a euphemism for a culture that is based on male supremacist values. This male supremacy just sounds so harsh. <laughs> but that's what it is. What you know? other phrase is there, right? It's like it's hard to come yeah. up with any other way to phrase that. Yeah. So, so when you really look at it from that perspective and that we're all in this together and can be loving about it and not blame each other because we are in dynamic. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that there's healing to be done because we're together and we're talking about these things and expressing them and sharing that we too have pain and we too have frustration and anger about the system that we all share, you know, and we carry wounds and we carry, uh, deep conditionings that we're unaware of a lot of times, lot, you know, you're, you're, you know, unusual and most men, or I shouldn't say most, a lot of men, certainly mainstream don't often really look into those social programmings as much. Mm. Right. I think spending time in these spaces is really yeah. helpful for that. Like you get to see just a lot of this stuff comes up. It's like um, how fictitious things are, how forced often. Yeah. I think it's just a natural consequence of consuming psychedelics or being in internal states for long periods of time or with regular intervals or something. Well, I'd love for you to ex- experiment with this, you know, explore that, what you shared. Um, mm. the, what I picked up was this sort of an exhaustion also, a frustration maybe too. It, it, yeah, for sure. Like, thank God I'm out of software, Zoe. Like, <laughs> I think it was killing me <laughs> for real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that work never ends. It's true. Mm. No, no. And the amount of exhaustion that's like, it's admired. It's like a valued trait. It's yes, like really, yes. yeah. Like the amount of damage done to my body is unbelievable from it. See, this is all really good stuff to explore, but mm. try to keep it around the, the, the culture and not just the culture, but the culture as a patriarchy. Because mm. there's so many different levels to it and we all have it. You know, because a lot of, I've found a lot of men, and this is true with women too, but a lot of men, this goes back to the action is character, okay? We're all in this this weird dynamic that's made up of all these social programmings that we all have and wounds we get along the way from it and just life that just just shit out and where we fell in the privilege, you know, kind of totem pole, right? I don't think I'm supposed to use the word totem pole, apologies. Um, in the, <laughs> hierar- the hierarchy. Okay, the mm-hmm. hierarchy is different. The perceived hierarchy, really. So all of those given circumstances of who you are in your life and the other people in your life, those dynamics play out just like in a play or a movie. They just do. They just play out. And if we're completely unconscious of those things or or not as conscious as we could be or we're just holding them and we're triggered by them or, or all of the above, then they run us, you know, and they do affect things. And some of them, by the way, some of these social programs are good. You know, there are some good things. Be polite to people. I think politeness is very important. You know, there are good things. They don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I think you'll know because I think these substances are, are truth serums. I think that they help mm. us see, right, the truth. And if you just, I mean, I'd love to hear what you come up with, you know, if you spend some time really exploring those things. And from that perspective, I'd love to hear what you come up with. Well, I will try to remember to keep you posted and I hope we get to talk. Uh, so we'll probably have to start wrapping up Zoe, but I, oh, I really yeah. hope we can do more of this, like um, exploring these topics and maybe bring in some cosmic sisters to have even three way conversations with us to um, just go deeper. It would be amazing. I mean, why not? We're all stuck at home. <laughs> you know we're all pipping you know it you know how many people are just whatever they're doing i've talked to a few uh <laughs> call them drug dealers just to genericize it and they're saying sales are off the charts <laughs> <laughs> um dealers. and it's a really interesting thing just to see that that's happening and you know what does that say is this like a thing that might help us be reborn <laughs> you know who knows i don't know could be. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is a very long conversation for anyone to listen to unless they're super interested. But I, I I think it's wonderful to catch up with you and just sort of know you're one of the good ones out there. And there are, there are a lot of really good people in this scene. And we're all working on ourselves. And we're, you know, none of us are perfect. And, you know, I think that I would want to end this on, it's not, you know, I don't think it's a good thing to publicly flog someone for doing something wrong. I think that sometimes if someone makes a mistake, we can be more compassionate and do that in private. 
I do. I just don't think it belongs in our culture. This is a medicine culture. We're all working on our most difficult things. We want to grow. We want to change. We're the good guys. I would say it's true with most folks. I think there's a couple exceptions, but you know, largely like what's happening could be handled a lot more, a lot more when skillfully. I, say I, that, I mean the ideal. Yeah, absolutely. You know, every scene's going to get its, its various jerks and whatnot. It's just going to happen. But the ultimate to me, the ultimate ideal of, of this psychedelic rena- renaissance is rediscovering the old ways. Let's face it. And, and recreating them for a modern world. The archaic revival concept. And I think there's a lot of value there. Like, how do we take that seriously? I love it. I think it just basically comes down to the same thing I talk about all the time is we're ultimately human beings and we have not, our species has not changed that much. So we're doing what our ancestors did and we're finding out similar things and we're just in a different time. And, you know, things are, they had hard times too. They had famine, they had disease, they had all sorts of wars and slavery and just terrible, you know, things happen in the old days. And childbirth was bad in a lot of cases, depending on when and where. All sorts of bad things happen in the past, but we have our own bad things. And one of the things that's the worst of it is we're running out of time. Mm-hmm. Time is up with the, with the earth, and so we really have to do something. It's it's whoever's alive today, whatever generation you're from, it's our job, right? And uh, yeah, so I I know one thing: I don't waste my time with people who aren't part of that sort of ideal current. Mm. <laughs> you know, representing the medicine. That doesn't mean we're perfect, of course. Like I said, nobody's perfect. But we're we're really trying. We're really putting it out there. There are a lot of people like that in this scene. And that is an inspiration to me. I'm exhausted too. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I love conversations like this. It makes me feel like it's worth it. So thank yeah. you, my friend. And let's do it again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Zoe. And how can people find Cosmic Sister? Oh, it's so easy. It's just everything's Cosmic Sister. Just, you know, Instagram is mostly where we're at these days. But yeah, I would if you're on Instagram, definitely check out Cosmic Sister Facebook also. But I have not been on social media for a, a little while because I've been dealing with COVID-19 related personal emergencies, non-health wise, which is I'm grateful about. But hopefully that will be over and we'll be back on track. We've got a lot to share. We've got some new Emerging Voices Awards coming up. We've got an entire two different um, conferences to share. And, you know, I, I'm really, I love doing that stuff. I just love sharing, you know, with with anybody who wants to follow Cosmic Sister. You don't have to be female. We've got at least 25% male, and that's been steady. And anybody, anyone who wants to be a male ally, you are so welcome. But I feel like one of the most exciting things to me about running Cosmic Sister is being able to lift the voices of these fascinating women. And there's just so many fascinating women. I can't possibly share them all. I don't have the resources. I could just be doing this day every day. The, the, the Renaissance is taking off in the wildest, most amazing speed. <laughs> and the, there's no lack of women in this scene. You know, when I first started this, it was like finding women, you know, finding women who knew women who knew women. And now it's, you know, it's just, there are just so many. Isn't mm. that great? I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, Zoe, I really appreciate it. And I, I think there's a lot that we could have dug into, <laughs> but I'm glad we took this long meandering path that we did. That's been really exciting. You can't, you can't say it all. And it's already what, what if we've been talking for what, two hours? Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what happened. And that's why we have well over 200 episodes of psychedelics today. It's uh, because these conversations are really just massive and wildly interesting. There you go. And yeah. it's time to get to the details. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And let's do it again sometime. All right, Zoe. Thanks again. Lots of love. And there you have it, Zoe Helene, Cosmic Sister. I hope you enjoyed it. 
This was a really interesting conversation for me. Gave me a lot to think about. And yeah, this isn't the first organization that has to deal with a lot of these issues. This is just a new iteration on an old theme. And we have an opportunity to really do well here. So let's try our best and really, really try to make this psychedelic movement what it can be, what we really hope it can be. So it's going to take a lot of hard work, a lot of serious imagination, challenging our inner assumptions and inner critics, all that kind of stuff. So a lot to work through, and I'm sure you have a lot to think about. So <laughs> let us know what you come up with. Um, you can hit us up on our Facebook group, um, just Psychedelics Today group on there, or hit us up via email, email at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And yeah, I think that's probably it. Again, you can leave us a small monthly donation at patreon.com slash psychedelics today or check out some of our classes. Also got some cool shirts and books available at psychedelicstodayshop.com. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. I really appreciate you all listening. Couldn't do it without you. And we will see you on the next episode in a couple days. Have a beautiful week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.